I'm going to walk you through how I manage three quarters of a million dollars in short puts. I'm trading the covered strangle mixed with some naked short puts right now in IWM, my go-to. And they are really base positions setting me up for the rest of the year. So I want to walk you through the positions that I put on, why I put them on, how I'm viewing the current markets, and how you might be able to trade short puts in your portfolio based on how it makes sense to you. What's up, everybody? Eric here. Welcome back to all the outliers. It is a new year. Same old story, though. Managing short puts. It's a big part of what I do, and it's for a good reason, because it's a great way to make money. I made pretty good money last year. I returned over 20%, not just trading short puts, but it's this is a big part of my strategy. So let's get over to the screen and let's dive right in. So as I already mentioned, we're going to be trading IWM, which is my go-to, and it is a mix between the covered strangle and the naked short puts. The reason why it's a mix is because I have the flexibility to do both. So I don't prematurely constrain myself to one or the other. There's no real reason for it. The time that would come up is if I decided to start adding on additional positions and I essentially was getting to the point where I couldn't cash secure everything, then I need to be more selective on what is indeed the covered strangle and what is indeed just a naked short put because the way I manage those is slightly different. So let's actually jump over first. These are the trades, but I wanna jump over to the platform so that you can see what I'm seeing in IWM. The very first thing is we are still on this broader decline. Let me zoom us out a year daily as you can see, I have to go a little further than that. We'll do a two-year daily. As we can see, we are really just kind of plugging down here. I actually need to redraw this line. So let's do that real quick while we're in here. And this is just to kind of keep track of how we're progressing off of these further term highs. And we didn't even really touch much of it here, which is kind of interesting for that trend line. And let's see what this one looks like there and then we'll zoom back in. I just wanna get some context on how we're treating these more recent highs versus previous highs. This is obviously kind of a, a bigger level, but the main thing I'm seeing here is uh, we have just got a lot of support here chopping sideways with 170 seemingly as the general base, at least so far. And when I put these trades on originally on the third, we had a nice update on the fourth, which is why I took a bunch of them off on the fourth, but I still have a lingering position now, which I'll show you. But all in all, I'm seeing general still bearishness with some interim support. So what that means to me is I'm not throwing everything in the kitchen sink at anything right now. I'm still being cautious with the capital, but I'm not being as cautious as I was for most of last year because we were in the process of going through a lot of turmoil. Whereas now I think a lot of that same turmoil, albeit might still be there, is digested. The other thing I wanna highlight is this implied volatility to historic volatility in kind of the variance risk premium as reverted to what it typically is. So what I mean by that is if we look at the implied volatility here and the historic volatility here, right now, as of today, there's like a six point premium on implied volatility versus historic. This wasn't the case. A lot of periods last year actually saw um, reversions to that, which I find interesting. We had periods where historic was higher than implied, but we're back to this more general sense of IV and there being some variance risk premium, which is why I'm trading short puts to capture that. So there's still some decent edge in there, at least as we can see via the lazy way, which is looking at IV versus HV, the correct way would actually be to have your own implied so uh, volatility surface model and then pricing the options yourself. I don't really waste my time with that because I don't think I would be able to create a model that was superior to what's already pricing things. So I kind of just accept the fact that the, the approach I use to identify variance risk premiums is not perfect. And that's okay because I have a lot of other things that I do in these trades to manage that. So now let's take a look at um, the rest of the near term at least, because I think it's important. So I'm gonna take us back into the six month and notice how the linear regression channels are actually starting to level out. They're still not level, but they're not, the slope of them is nowhere as steep as what we saw in this one year daily. So if we go back here, and then if we zoom in a little further to the three month, interesting perspective, huh? 
And realistically, a lot of the timeframes I'm trading are more suited towards the three month. So I do think that what we're seeing right now is again, some short term support, but it's nothing that I trust too much, but it does lead me to be more willing to put some risk out there. And we even have some positive sloping linear aggression channels, which I do find interesting. So taking us back over to the trades, what do we have going on here? So the very first thing is, we have, what is this, uh, 45 lots out across different expirations, across different strikes. So you can see what we have here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the punchline here is it comes out to this. This was, if I were to cash secure everything, $770,000 in total, and for portfolio margin, it's only $90,000, which is why I like portfolio margin so much. It gives me just an insane amount of flexibility. And this is why you'll see the way I calculate the returns is not using this uh, $770,000 because it's not just sitting there um, set aside for these trades. It did happen to just be sitting there because I didn't do anything with it, but I would have happily allocated the, that away if I saw an opportunity, box spread, something like that. But the punchline here is this is just portfolio margin and it provides pretty good leverage. So this was all done on the 3rd of Jan, except for this trade right here. This 181 put uh, 10 lot expiring 13 Jan, this is pre-existing from last year. I actually got into this in December. So this is down right now, which we'll talk about that in just a moment, but let's see what happened on the 4th of Jan. So I ended up taking in this 15 lot, this 17 Feb 10 lot, and the 6 Jan 10 lot. The interesting part is, as you can tell, the 6 Jan, and the reason why they're ordered like this is this is the order I put the trades on. And the 6 Jan, the 171 puts, those were expiring tomorrow, Friday. And interestingly enough, they saw pretty good appreciation, but so did everything else. So let's take a look at these. Trade one, which is the 15 lot of 168 puts for 247, those saw 66% um, capture rate, which I realize is a bold face lie. These are switched. So it's actually a 41% capture rate. So this one, I captured 41% max profit and the um, 171s expiring on 6 Gen, those were a 66% max profit. I was like, that makes no sense. Um, but anyways, all of them hit my minimum threshold is really what it comes down to. When I'm selling either naked short puts or cash secured puts, I have a percentage of max profit charted out that tells me based on the percentage of time remaining from initial entry, what are my optimal exit points? And I've built that over a huge data set combined of both literally tens of thousands of real trade data and also hundreds of thousands of back test trade data. So what I've done is create a band that tells me if I take max profit within you know X percentage with X percentage of time remaining, I'm essentially executing optimally. And the reason why I'm leaning towards the lower part of the band for some of these is because of the way that the market's been reacting. Now, again, recently we've had some very, very base modality here, right? We've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 days in a row where essentially we're moving between 177 and 170, like $7 range, which is pretty small. Because if you look at this up here, a one week standard deviation is $6.52, plus or minus. So we're within a one standard deviation for the week, but that's been for two weeks. So definitely lower overall probabilities that that would happen. It just means that the market's not really moving that much, which is why we're seeing the variance risk premium where it's at. So with all of that, I took all of those trades down and it netted me um, $3,425 profit, which is a 4.9% return on invested capital, which is using the portfolio margin requirement. And with that, I redeployed. So right now I have a 30 lot out in 27 Jan, 171 puts for $2.13. So I'm gonna pivot back over to the platform because both of these trades are still on. We have these on and we have these on. I really wanna talk about these, the 13 Jans, because they're coming up on time to, to be managed. And I think I have them, yeah, you can see them down here. Um, 
So let's take a look at this. If we pull up the 13 Jan, we can see my beautiful, as per usual, because the market just really likes to play games with me. We can see my beautiful, let me shrink my head a little bit so it's easier to see. Um, we can see these 181 puts that are in the money. Right now, I sold them out again at 365. They're trading for 783. So that is a unrealized loss of $4,175. So no big deal there. Got plenty of time left and it's not making any sort of like crazy insane move. So here's the game plan. I'm keeping an eye on the extrinsic value, which there's still 56 cents. I'm gonna take a look at the um, the current price, which again, 783, and I can essentially take a look at different role opportunities. I'm gonna close this down just a little bit, a few lines so it's easier for you to see. And let's say if I want to roll them tomorrow, just for whatever reason, and let's say I wanna go out a couple weeks, maybe we'll just go to the 27 Jan, take a look. The first thing I'm gonna do is see where I can find $7.83 which is right here. And that's essentially at the same price. Okay, that's the first threshold we're looking at. What this tells me is if I wanted to roll them slightly early, I would be able to pull in a dollar and 42 cents of extrinsic value, which is good. And then if I hold those to expiration, ceteris paribus, everything else remains the same, then I would still be able to make a small profit on it, roll again until we're out of the trade. So that's one course of action. Another course of action could be go further out. I want to stay within 50 days, but let's see if I can find that same 783, which I can here at 178, which is beautiful. So this means that if I wanted to be a little more aggressive, I can roll it down at least three points while still collecting a credit. Or if I was okay taking slightly lower um, overall return on the trade, I could even go further because again, rolling for a credit is important, but that if you don't roll for a credit, does it, it doesn't immediately mean that you now have no money, that it's all gone. So we have a little bit of flexibility on still being profitable, even if we roll for a debit. I just look to avoid it so that you're collecting a little bit more of the life cycle of the trade. But let's just say, for example, we take these 181s down here to 178, which is $4 of extrinsic value. So that means essentially these would be trading at three and change at expiration, ceteris paribus. So that's another profitable approach depending on how the market behaves here. So my leaning right now is uh, to wait, to not do anything. We still have 56 cents left because again, let's follow this example through to the end. If we take out the 56 cents, let's just ballpark it and say that it essentially will be trading for seven and a quarter. So if I go to the same 181 puts, but at a near expiration, which just simulates the passage of time, everything else remaining the same, it's trading for again, like $7 and 40 cents, something like that. So we could wait until then. And then we can see again, pretending if it's trading for $7 and 40 cents, and we look out at some more of the rolls, we can then actually roll for a small credit, even just going out a couple weeks, which would be my preference here. I want to remain a little more on my toes here with the trade, and that's really all there is to it. So I'm gonna wait at least another couple days, keeping an eye on the extrinsic value, making sure that it does not fall below a dime. Once it falls below a dime, the probability of early assignment becomes more, um, more likely, and I can always unassign the trade via closing out selling puts that cover the cost, but it's just easier not to go through all that and just keeping the trade on and live. So that's all there is on that one. The 30 lot is essentially just chilling. It's going against me a little bit right now. It's an unrealized loss of 2550, but we're still okay. It's a 37 Delta. I offered it at a 32 Delta. One last thing that I wanna highlight is the Delta selection. So far last year, I'm finishing going through all the data, but I'm actually gonna start preferring things between a 25 and a 30 Delta, vice 30 to 35 Delta. And that's just because of where I'm seeing the greater pricing of variance risk premiums, which I think is important to keep in mind as we're going forward. As always, if you have any questions or anything that you want me to go over, let me know. If you made it to the end, don't forget to like the video. And if you didn't subscribe, consider doing that. Be an outlier, see y'all later.